Hello, my fan friends. Welcome to another Rahala Stapa, another one recorded at the tail end of my COVID isolation. I'm in my pajamas um, and uh, feeling fine, though. Don't worry, I'm OK. I think I'm going to get through this. Uh, the guest is the director, actor, musician Laura Jean Marsh, who directed the film and wrote and starred in the film Giddy Stratospheres, which I had a part in, which we recorded in 2020. It was out last year. It's available on, on Amazon Prime. If you're with Amazon Prime, oh, you can rent it elsewhere. Give it a look, see what you think, see me acting. It's all lots of fun. Um, it's funny and quite uh, it's quite serious in places as well, though. So uh, strap in, if that's your thing, if you want to go back to 2007 and the music scene of the time. Uh, anyway, do become a monthly badger if you're not already. Go fasterstripe.com slash badges. You can help us make more content. Help us make a movie which we'll talk about a bit more, as I allude to it, I think, in this podcast. But so uh, that's coming up. And uh, help us make another podcast about my testicles, uh, especially one of them. Uh, so go fasterstripe.com slash badges. You get all kinds of rewards and extras. And it's lots of fun. Anyway, let's sit back, relax and enjoy Raha Lastapa with the wonderful and super talented, multi-talented Laura Jean Marsh. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man. He's still safe, self-isolating. He's still in his pajamas. It's Richard Herring. Hello, my fan friends. Welcome to another episode of Richard Herring's Lobbing Serbian Tennis Players podcast. That's right. That was topical at the time of recording. Uh, Djokovic has gone back to Serbia. It's, it fits. It almost fits. And also lobbing is a tennis term. It's very clever. What I've done there, though, I was talking to Ian Wordle the other day and that, the bloke is that is practically his name. The, the man who invented Wordle, the hit word game on the Internet. Uh, I know usually for this bit, I choose things that are very out of date. But the 10 in the 10 days between me saying this and this actually being broadcast as a podcast, I think Wordle will have become a thing of the past. That is my guess. I'm enjoying it at the moment. Anyway, uh, Ian Wordle calls it. Rahalastapa, and he gets it first time every time. It's very clever. Anyway, yes, I'm um, I'm still in my pajamas. I've still got uh, the coronavirus, COVID nineteen. Still, my one. Don't know who else has had that. Um, uh, I've not yet tested negative, but I'm allowed to leave the house on Wednesday, regardless, because that's the new rules, isn't it? That's the all the new rules because of Boris Johnson. We're allowed to do anything we want. Um, it's very exciting to be doing these remotely. This one was met. This, these, I'm, I'm, foolishly, I've, I've decided to try doing two podcasts in an, a night for the first time ever when I'm very ill. I don't know why I would do that. I haven't been too bad. Uh, we were meant to be doing these at the Phoenix, but uh, we are doing them remotely and it will be a pleasure to do so. Uh, we are doing some gigs at the Phoenix uh, on the uh, 24th, which might be too late for people uh listening to this at home uh, of January and then we're I'm at the Bristol Slapstick Festival at the end of January uh, the Leicester Comedy Festival in uh, February I think it's the 19th with Jos Norris and Rebecca Wheatley and then back at the Leicester Square Theatre at the end of February God, if God be willing in his heaven above so please do listen in uh, it's been fun self isolating my son's got uh, the Covid uh, my wife and daughter have not got Covid it's in incredible um uh, and we have been mixing a little bit because we live in the same house. Um, but um, my daughter, uh, the other day, had drawn a picture of a face uh, and stuck it up on the wall. And she insisted that the name of the face was Jeff, right? It's that, that Jeff was the name she chose. I don't know where she got Jeff from. We don't know anyone called Jeff. Uh, to begin with, she stuck Jeff on the wall and played a sort of slightly ineffectual game of catch with him where you throw the ball towards Jeff. Uh, or, or the wall, depending on how you look on it. And Jeff, or the wall, would knock it back to it. Couldn't catch it. We then had a family disco where everyone got to choose a song. Jeff chose uh, a Katy Perry one, like Phoebe did. They got very similar taste, taste. Phoebe then took Jeff off the wall and started dancing with him and then announced that Jeff was her husband. It was all happening so fast. Uh, I wasn't sure I approved of my daughter. I'll, I'll put a picture of him up for you people at home. Show. There he is. That's Jeff. If you're watching this live, you'll be able to see him. Uh, I wasn't sure I approved of my daughter marrying Jeff. I knew so little about him. And to be honest, he's got a bit of a smirk on his face that I don't like. 
but you can't stand in the way of love. And I guess I just have to accept that my daughter is married to a piece of paper and hope that works out for these two kids. I'm presuming Jeff is a kid. If I find out he's 25, then I don't care about what happens to me. I don't care about prison. I will rip that pervert to shreds. As long as Jeff is six or seven, then I suppose it's all right for them to get married. But I mean, what six or seven year old is called Jeff? I'm very worried about it. Uh, we've been in COVID lockdown for, for all this week and already Phoebe's gone a bit Tom Hanks in Castaway. But who can I blame for that? Or uh, uh, Probably myself. All my friends are made out of papier-mâché. Uh, yeah, it's your thought, Richard. Uh, it's Ali Sloper from Twitch of Fun. He's just turned up. It's cross-promotion. Yes, it's your thought, Richard. All your friends are made out of paper, aren't they? Papier-mâché or out of, out of the resin. Look, I've got a guest waiting. I don't want you coming in and making her uh, think I'm mental. I think she knows you're mental. I don't think you have to worry about that. <laughs> they thought you are your nun and dad, and the, then she look has done this. It might be my fault, Ali. Thank you very much. That she's, that she's in love with a piece of paper. Um, I'm being old-fashioned, I suppose. In my day, you didn't just marry a piece of paper with a drawing on it, but all that matters is my daughter is happy, and Jeff makes her happy. I wish I could trust him. You sometimes have to go with your gut. I just don't know if someone should marry the first face they draw on a piece of paper. There are so many other pictures out there. Don't tie yourself down, darling. Anyway, look, we're going to crack on because uh, we've got lots to get in tonight. Uh, my guest tonight is probably best known uh, for playing a Jewel Thistleton in resting. That's why we're all here tonight watching this. It's Laura Jean Marsh, ladies and gentlemen. There she is. Hello, Laura. Hello, mate. How are you doing? <laughs> Do you remember being in resting? There was a lot to choose from, Laura. What were the others? Uh, I I quite with the problem that X Men First Class is too good, but you were in an uncredited role in X Men First Class. I was lobbed in a cupboard in in X Men. Um, Me and some other ladies all got put in a cupboard. Yeah, but um, resting was a a sick sitcom that never happened. And I, I saw there was one ep- one episode of it on. Uh, <laughs> that was the pilot with, that never happened. With Robert Robert Lindsay. Yes, Lindsay was in it. Yeah. Uh, somebody else funny was in it. Who was it? Somebody played like a chimney sweep. Can't remember, but yeah. <laughs> Did it get? Was it broad? Was it non broadcast or was it broadcast? It, it was pitched and never happened. <laughs> okay. I thought I thought you were gonna. I, 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 I what would I you have you chosen? Gonna, well, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't have. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I thought you were going to bring up because uh, I just thought the obvious one would be the if you were choosing things from my Wikipedia that I don't know who put up. Yeah, uh, was MTV walking around naked? And MTV. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about that. Obviously, <laughs> I was just like, oh, he's definitely going to bring that up. But, well, yeah, I'll bring no. that up. Let's bring it up now. What was what you were in MTV? Because you're you're well. Look, people may not know who you are, Laura Jean Marsh. But you're yeah, a, a, you're an actor, you're a model, um, you're a musician. Uh, so w- one of your modelling jobs was walking naked through Brixton, according to Wikipedia. Is that for MTV? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, I, I walk, that's basically what happened. I just walked through Brixton and the whole crew were hiding. So I basically just walked through Brixton naked. But I mean, I wasn't wasn't completely naked. I had like patches over my bit. Okay. But um, yeah, it was pretty. It was actually quite fun, weirdly. It felt like, you know, like a dream. (laughs) (laughs) And I definitely had one of those moments before I walked out where I was just like, I don't have to do this. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm going to <laughs> I'm here now yeah. and lots of people in shops and like out on the street selling stuff whatever didn't know what the fuck was going on and I just had to walk around I imagine left. you got some comments from the 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 men was it near the tube there's a lot of men in Brixton hanging around by the tube that's my main memory of Brixton having got off there quite a lot of times when I lived in that area well it was weird because the other people because it wasn't just me there was a few other people um Okay. Cast in that, cast in that. Less clothes, less clothes, more music. It was, was what it was called. And um, we all chatted after afterwards about the sort of reactions we got, and everyone was just terrified of us. <laughs> no one was, no one was sexualizing us or, or going anywhere near us. Everyone was like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? What, what just... was what was MTV's thinking behind this? That less clothing, more music. What, I, the, the, can't I you have, you can have you can have more music and people can still wear clothes they don't have to be... i don't know they were doing some sort of like sexy summer nonsense okay. and uh yeah but actually it was quite fun i don't mind don't oh. mind the nudity yeah well that's all that's all part of the job look are you grew up in or you're born in somerset did you grow up in somerset 
I was born in Trowbridge, sunny Tro- Trowbridge. Right. Uh, I haven't managed Castle. to find that. Tro- is um, Trowbridge in Somerset, or is it in? Is it in? Is it in the West uh, Wiltshire? Country. It's Wiltshire, yeah. yeah. So it's just outside Swindon, Chippenham, yeah. proper sort of farmer country, in a little suburban sort of village just outside Trowbridge. I grew up, which is. I lived in my grand's house and I had my mum and my dad and my two brothers there. Uh, and then I moved to Bath when I was three, when my parents split up. Okay. And that's where I went to school. And I, I lasted there until I was 16 and then I buggered off. <laughs> <laughs> Bath's very nice though. Yeah, I went to um, a all girls state school, uh, okay. which was not dissimilar to a mental asylum. Um, it was a bit like sort of British version of Girl Interrupted. I don't know if you've seen that film, but lots of that, lots of girls um, trying to survive being bullied and and lots. Of, it, I had a great art teacher, but it was it wasn't the best school in the world. Sorry, Hayesfield. <laughs> uh, <laughs> terrible music department and music was sort of everything to me at that point. So I didn't last long. I suspect, in, uh, knowing a little bit about you, that you are quite a rebellious. <laughs> student in any case i was quite oh yeah i guess so on paper maybe i was yeah. very, i was i wasn't um i wasn't self-destructive uh at that age i was very creative i was writing lots of music um my family were all musicians so i just wanted to start a band right so and there wasn't a great music department in hayesfield it was kind of covered in cobwebs and you know it wasn't wasn't great and uh at that point my my oldest brother lived in london and we're really close, played by Nick Helm in my film. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, we, I just did a runner and started a band in London when I was about sort of late, late teens. Um, so was that Screaming Ballerinas? Was that the, the band yeah. you started? Yes. Yeah, yeah so stra- that was my band. Yeah, so straight in. Pretty uh, much, yeah. A little bit of finding my feet and meeting people, meeting musicians and creative sort of kids. And yeah, and I, then I started a band. That's kind was of... that, it was, so was that around because we uh, you you've uh, I was in a film that you wrote and directed called Giddy Stratospheres, which is about the sort of noughties and the music scene in the noughties. So was this was this when you got there? We did you arrive in the middle of that sort of era, or were you there a bit earlier? And then this film sort of set a bit later than that. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of fell in love with um, a, a bunch of bands that were really inspiring me, uh, and I went to a couple of music festivals when I was sort of fifteen and. Uh, for the day I went to Glastonbury for the day and I went to Reading Festival for the day and at that point I was feeling quite bored with my life as a teenager in this <laughs> school so I, I, I sort of remember feeling just like oh, this is what I need to be doing I need to be around music and people making lots of noise um, so I convinced my mum and my dad that I'd be all right if I moved to London <laughs> um, and bless my brother was here uh and he was he's 11 years older than me so he was sort of there was a lot of responsibility I think put on him just to check in with me but um yeah I think I was I was persuasive <laughs> and I was all right you know I, I did start the band and we didn't do very well here but we we had a bit of a following in Italy so we went and did lots of tours over in Italy and you know I was rebellious but I also think I, I achieved quite a lot even within that small sort of that small time I was in the band, but I think we did all right. It yeah. was fun. Mm. Well, I think you, you're someone who gets things done. That's, that's certainly what, <laughs> what I know about you. And, I, and I, I'm not surprised that you'd be the kind of person who, at 16, would be would be that sort of sure of themselves and 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 want to go out into the world and do stuff. I mean, you 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 were kind of on the scene a lot by the looks of things. There's a few bit the few bits I've found about from that time is uh, you kind of. I think this is on your website, but you time out called you everyone's favourite poser and you were sort of a sort of party at all the parties. Yeah, well, we, right? so I had a I had a club night um, called Dolly Rockers, which we, we used to have uh, five bands. At that time, there was sort of, there was so many amazing sort of unsigned and unknown bands. Uh, so we'd have five bands on and I'd DJ with my friend Eloise and it was it was a really exciting time for music um but it was also super messy and uh you know incestuous and a little bit dangerous for a lot of us because we were all you know kind of on our own a lot of us were on our own with our families in other towns so yeah uh all hell broke broke loose often um 
but yeah, I, I sort of I, I put on these club nights and I DJ at other people's club nights and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But that was the same at the same time I was I was doing my own music as well. Sure. Um, and so you you started doing acting as well. Was that sort of simultaneous, or was that a bit after after the? Uh, yeah, I think um, I, I was sort of banging my head against the wall trying to get a record deal. And although we did have this sort of minimal success in uh, in Europe, um, people didn't really want to sign female fronted indie bands in London and in the UK. It was very cock heavy. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So we, you know, I was only 19 and I was kind of in charge of this band and I wrote all the songs and it's quite young to be in charge of something like that. And yeah. we, we kept getting turned down and it, it wasn't an easy time to be a chick in a band. So I just sort of gave up really, I think, if I'm honest. And at that right. point I started getting cast and stuff. Um, I did a few sort of sketch shows. Like I had tiny roles in Peep Show and Uncle where I met our Nick. Um, yeah, so you're a pregnant crack addict in Uncle. <laughs> I was. I was a pregnant crack addict and <laughs> uncle. Uh, yeah, and that was, you know, I, I just sort of, just from uh, being cast and stuff and loving being on set and enjoying comedy and doing bits and pieces like that, I just found myself getting cast and stuff more often, got myself an agent and I fell in love with being on set and started writing my own stuff and that kind of leads us <laughs> on yeah, well, I mean, the... now, so I've skipped quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well the film's yeah. very interesting because one of the films is we well, should talk about it because it's sort of based you know because it is based on i don't know how autobiographical there's obviously quite a lot of autobiography in there but it's sort of it's interesting to me we'll talk about the film as well but the but sort of what was the 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 sort of the fact that you got this off the ground and it sort of happened very quickly didn't it and it's sort yeah. of for almost from nowhere you was it during the lockdown that you sort of had the idea is that right well, it's funny. I think the last time you and I chatted on Zoom, we were discussing which gla <laughs> which glasses we should get you. And my yeah. my wonderful cost my wonderful costume designer Aaron, who who I, I don't know if you remember Aaron. I do. I can't. Yeah. Unforgettable. Unforgettable. He's he was so he was my friend, and he's you know my best mate, and I've known right. him since I was like eighteen. So he was he was actually one of the guys one of those poses. Right. <laughs> you know. So we've known each other forever. So he was a he was kind of one of the first people that I, when I wrote the scripts um, I had on board and luckily he's an amazing costume designer and an artist and stuff. So, but yeah, I wrote the script and when we first went into lockdown, um, I had a bit of a kind of smack in the face. Uh, not a, Nobody actually smacked me in the face, but I was, I was running through a park and listening to old sort of bangers, music stuff that I like that really inspired me. And one song in particular came on that, sort of triggered lots of memories from the time, which was Giddy Stratospheres by the Long Blondes. Um, <clears throat> and they were an amazing band at the time. And lots of memories came back to me and we lost lots of friends back then um, through sort of various different horrendous circumstances. Um, and I also kind of, you know, there was just stuff that I hadn't really dealt with and it all came back to me. And I just started writing this script and I was, I'd, I'd made a few short films and I'd written a few other ideas. We, was, we were going to, me and a couple of mates were going to make a, a different film during that time, which I now have kind of shelved. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I wrote Giddy Stratospheres and it was, yeah, pretty autobiographical, I'd say. I mean, I changed a few names and, and changed myself and from a musician to an artist, uh, yeah. uh, like a painter and like bits and pieces were different, but it was, it's pretty... Obviously, there's comedy in there, which is why we got, you know, you in. Um, but it was, the original script was a little bit darker and then I tweaked it. And yeah, I mean, before I knew it, I had sort of just, I'd managed to get a few people to invest in the film that were really into the, the period of time and really loved the script. And then, you know, before I know it, I was chatt chatting to you, chatting to Nick, casting roles. Yeah. Aaron to sort out the wardrobe, finding locations and it, it I, I thought originally it would just be this little thing I'd put on YouTube and now it's going to be you know it's been released in the UK and America uh, and it's going to be going all around the world by the yeah. end of the year I mean it's sort so, of incredible you know story of what can be achieved if you put your mind to it and if you you know and it's not I mean it's in film terms it was it's not a big budget film it's a very small budget film if you can if you can get together a you know a few thousand pounds uh mm. and and find you know and you you obviously work with a lot of your friends yeah. within it as well but, but that's a nice thing to do but was it 
Are you did you ever directed anything? You're not. You did. Were you directing music videos at that point, or was this the first? Yeah. Thing you directed? So I I directed a couple of shorts that I'd written as well, yeah. uh, and I know you know being musical directing music videos was I was absolutely loving doing that, and uh, I still love doing that. Um, but no, I definitely hadn't directed a feature film and I definitely hadn't directed one that I had written and I was going to star in. Yeah. So originally I was going to cast someone as me and then I just thought, fuck it, this is, happen <laughs> this is happening now, I might as well fucking do it. And obviously the ages of us all was just made no sense, which I know that you've, you've pointed out before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was playing yours, and which I don't mind playing your father, but I was playing Nick Helm's father and, he, and he's 13 years younger than me. And, you know, I think looks worse than I do as well so I'm you know I was at the time I was a I was a little unfit and uh, we we aged me up a bit to play oh, so yeah. I was playing you I was playing your dad which I didn't research in a, a great detail but I don't know how how close these characters in the in the film were to the real the real people but uh, there was definitely some strong influence in there I would say well I mean there's quite a few characters in the film uh that are pretty close to the bone i mean yeah. there was one there was one moment where i was in the church filming that day with you and i mean that was a really stressful day with, for us just as a crew and also just me in general because after you guys left i had to do that uh I, god i keep giving i have to be careful with spoilers for anyone that yeah. hasn't seen it but that you know i had a quite an emotional moment in the film and i we'd already had such a fucking massive day and it was just so and we'd lost we didn't have beth there that day who was the producer because she had to deal with something and Aaron, the costume designer, Aaron just came up to me and he went, you're, bu you're burning some bridges here, mate. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just looked at him and was like, it's too late now. <laughs> uh, everyone's seen the film. Uh, we're all still talking. Okay, um, that's yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think uh, my family are really proud of me. You know, I've, I've made this thing that is very much from my heart. Um, I, I actually watched it this morning for the first time since the premiere, which because uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't watch it for ages because it's so close. Uh, and it, I was exhausted by the end of watching it because I felt <laughs> like I'd just gone through it all again. But I yeah. am really proud of everybody, you know. Like you said, like, you know, Josh, who plays Jasper, Beth, who, who plays Bella, they were the producer and the first AD on the film. Uh, everyone, you know, the crew, everyone, the cast, it, it was such a great, a great group. So, and and it, you, I mean, it was all being filmed, not, I mean, it wasn't during a lockdown, was it? It was between, did you manage to film the whole thing between the lockdowns, basically? Was that how, how you managed to do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, we did. We Sorry, my cat's attacking. Come and say That's hello okay. to your granddad. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we filmed during lockdowns and then we filmed a little bit after Christmas as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was tough because we had to, to make sure everyone was safe, but not one person tested positive if you can imagine that with all that massive crew <laughs> well it was, a, it was a it was a fair size crew but also you were doing these scenes uh obviously that i wasn't i was i was not involved in the the bacchanalia and the drugs and the dancing but you're doing all this these scenes within a club where everyone's off their faces and and it, you you had a very small amount of people for that really but it it did it did, does look like a yeah. It's very hard, I think, in 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 films to make anything like any kind of disco or, or dance place or anything look real. They always look yeah. Not, they always look fake. Yeah, with a very small number of people, you do sort of get this real feel. I think of oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean that was the one thing that I was you know looking back on it that there are a few gaps in the crowds that I definitely yeah. would have liked to have filled in. <laughs> but actually, weirdly, you know, uh, those club nights that we used to put on, they weren't like you know, they, they were more niche, you know, it was like a niche little culty kind of, kind of, we, you were, they weren't massive successful bands. So it wasn't always full. So I do think it just, we just about got away with it for those scenes. But for my next projects, I'm, I'm sort of gunning for huge Glastonbury crowds <laughs> and I'm going to get them. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I would, I'm really excited at the prospect of being able to pull off like a massive crowd watching, you know, some epic bands and some of my other things so sure well that's what's kind of exciting about it um i suppose that by you know it's it's a calling card as well i mean it's a, it's a great thing in itself but to mm. to be able to put together a, a film on your own that mm. kind of quickly and that and that well 
and and then you know that's a calling card to get other work and to get more finance and and be able to do bigger things and it, it's sort of i find that fascinating that that's now uh more possible i guess because costs costs have come down i suppose in terms of making film because equipment is available and if you're mm. it, uh, you know i suppose something like the blair witch project sort of did a very low mm. what looked like a low budget film it probably wasn't that low budget once they I, don't know, the I, I, I think the blair witch project actually i think it was about a million right <laughs> and actually technically i mean we went to bifa recently um because we were long listed at bifa for giddy and and there was you know the the, the other films we were up against were all like millions <laughs> but they yeah. were supposed to be indie films and it's like we don't stand a fucking chance <laughs> um but i think i think blair witch project was um was a million yeah right. which is still low you know it's still loads but it's sort of possible and i've been working with jamie adams and we're doing another we're doing something else mm. together and you know the, the budgets for that are sort of it's still a you know a significant amount mm. of money, but it's within the reach of uh, of someone with a little bit of investment or a little or some you know funding coming from somewhere. And you know I think that's it. If you if you just get off your ass and do it, mm. there's then it can lead, and it doesn't have to be a, a movie. Even you know it can be just a short film or just a sketch or something. But it's sort of interesting that it leads on to these other things and that you're yeah. then you know you're talking about doing higher budget films and, and yeah <laughs> and big yeah. Crowd scenes um so it's very exciting the way that goes and so were you were you anticipating that it would you you didn't did you just do it and thought what let's see what happens with it, or did you know it's going to have a limited release or did you what, what, when um, you were filming it did you know what was going to happen with it well I think um part of me I don't know it just all sp it all spiraled out of control very quickly <laughs> um you know just from contacting the bands from our soundtrack because we've got a really great soundtrack from that time and yeah. just people saying yes and people reading the script and really liking it I mean Bulldog our UK distribution company were on board just from my script you know they hadn't seen the film so you know I, I realized quite soon after I you know started sending it out that it was something that people were interested in um and I think that kind of side of me from being a kid in a band that never really succeeded <laughs> as a musician just kept thinking, well, I guess I'm going to have to really go for this. <laughs> um, and no, I, di I didn't I didn't think that. I, I think I felt I, I really enjoyed writing it and I wanted to make make it. Um, but I don't, I don't think I thought it would get this far. I certainly didn't think it would be released everywhere <laughs> all over the world and it would get good reviews and people would... You know, it's had a nice resurgence since um, it's gone to Amazon Prime here, and I've had yeah. so much love from people about it, and it's it's really it's really really nice. <laughs> yeah, it's really well, nice. Know, that's it's it. You know, it's. I just think it's for people who are creative out there or in any field. I mean, you, you know, you've obviously done this in music. You've just said I'm going to do it and see what happens, and you've done it in yeah. film. I'm going to do it and see what happens, and you know, you can. You know, it's not, you haven't got, I mean, if I'm almost the most famous person in it, you haven't got very good, you haven't got very big star names in it. So you haven't even, you know, you don't need to, you know, to, to create something. A, you can, you can get in ton contact with people and you'd be surprised mm -hmm. at who does things, I think. But also you can, you can do something like this with, with a group of people you know are good and who'll do a good job. And, and I think that for a first thing, it's almost... It's almost yeah. better that there's there's not recognisable people in it, I suppose. I think I think that um, I'm not really because I'm a bit of an indie kid. It wasn't like for me. I I wrote the script and the first person that I thought of to play Murray with you, <laughs> and the first person I thought of to play Nick, um, uh, Nick to play yeah. Tom or Tim as we call him in a film was was Nick. And so it wasn't like oh who can I get? It's like it was like I've got to get rich. And <laughs> so you know, and you absolutely smashed it. You were so brilliant and and charismatic and funny. So oh, well, you know. Well, it's true. But, you know, um, it's sort of fun. I mean, I don't get, I hardly ever get asked to do it. Nearly all the acting I've done is stuff I've written myself. So it's, I hardly ever get asked to do anything. So, and, you mm. know, like it was, it was like whatever, November <laughs> in 2020. 2020, and, uh, yeah. 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 And so it was, you know, there wasn't a lot going on in any case. So, you know, oh, I think, fine. but yeah. I think, but I think people <laughs> will, you know, but, but I would have done it. I would have done it. What, yeah, whatever yeah. I was doing, to be honest, is, you know, as long as I wasn't a, 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 out of the country or something. But it's, but it's, um, which doesn't seem likely. Uh, but, you know, I think, but I think by asking people and you got, I think you contacted me by via Instagram and I'd only I slid really. slid into your DMs like yeah, a snake. I don't, but both. <laughs> 
both both the films I got offered in lockdown. I got more acting work in lockdown than I've ever had in my life. Both of the film, you know, two films, and both were offered to me via Instagram, which I think I'd only yeah. just set it's up amazing. as well. It's amazing. Yeah. It's such a bloody good tip for anybody trying to do stuff because, I, I mean, I'm writing a, an article on Shane Meadows at the moment for a magazine because okay. he's one of my biggest influences and I just thought it would be fun to interview people about him. And sorry about my cat. Can you hear that? <laughs> um so I and I've just been messaging people on Instagram going like, you know, these actors and people that work with them and people that I, I really respect just going, do you want to talk about Shane Meadows? And I'm like, yeah, sure, when you're free. <laughs> but if you go through agents and stuff, you just don't get, you know, it's better to be, I think I'm a one-on-one kind of person. So, yeah. yeah. Be, so it's be a bit cheeky, just find, you know, find, I mean, that's what I do with this this podcast as well, is that it's easier to get guests via Twitter or, or wherever than yeah. it is to go through agents so I very rarely go through agents I mean some of them I don't know some people I know for but a lot of people I've, I've got on this guesting with who wouldn't know and you know people are amenable to do stuff so that's interesting uh yeah and it's you know to put the, if you put something together and give it a go the worst thing that can happen is yeah you know, it's it's no good and no one wants to yeah. see it and it, it, it what was because when you it, when you're acting in something as well i i, I don't I, you show me some of the script but i hadn't seen the whole script or at least i hadn't written the whole script re- mm. read the whole script um you don't know as an actor whether that something's going to be good or not i've done you know i've been for i've been for auditions with i did there was a film called uh, manila envelopes that actually got to the point where it was made. I don't think it was ever released. <laughs> no, okay. it, had quite, it had quite a good cast in it, and I got mm. I got this audition, and it was a very weird audition in this in someone's house. And then there was this whole weird experience of playing an interview. It was before I done was doing interviews, but I was playing I was basically playing Tony Wilson. But oh. the the cameraman thought I was Tony. He was from Spain, and he thought I was Tony Wilson. <laughs> And he was saying what a big fan of mine he was. And I was a bit confused. Why would you be auditioning to play yourself? <laughs> and it was when we were filming it. But then it, I don't know what I don't know what that was, right? And I didn't I don't know whether it would have been any good when it came mm. when, if it was put together I never saw it. But it was it was probably a bigger like bigger crew and a, and, and more money spent on it than uh, getting mm. stratospheres. And so you never know when you when you get a script, when you've seen it, how it's gonna turn out. So mm-hmm. I think both Nick sort of saw it before I did, and he said, it's "Yeah, really, it's really good." Don't worry. <laughs> I love that you two so... are sneaking around, messing <laughs> each other. Because you it... kind of think, you know, it could be this, could be yeah, it could be shit. This could be terrible. Uh, this could we don't know. We don't, could be shit. Yeah, we don't yeah. know what the rest of it's going to be. No, I know. So... Well, actually, Nick told me that he was he was sneaking. <laughs> like he was, he came to the rap party which you couldn't make, and um. And he was, yeah, he's, yeah, he told me that he messaged you to say it's yeah. not shit. <laughs> it's not shit. Don't worry. It's not shit. I totally get that. Yeah. But, you know, it's, but it's really, it's really nice for me to, to, to have the chance to, and it, I don't think it would, I wouldn't have put myself in that part necessarily as the yeah. first choice, but it was nice to have a go at something like that. And it was really good fun to do it. So yeah, good. people in the UK can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's available yeah. to buy rent as, elsewhere if you if you haven't yeah, Amazon Yeah, it's Prime. on Sky Cinema and it's got on iTunes and it's on stuff that I didn't know existed, like Microsoft TV and okay. like Google Play and <laughs> things like that. But yeah, it's now free on Amazon Prime if you've got that membership thing. Yeah, um, yeah so you can see see our movie and see and you that, in action. See me <laughs> acting. <laughs> well, in my next book, so the series I'm pitching at the moment, which yeah. people seem to be interested in, is called Stutter. And it's yeah. set in the 90s in a sort of alternate Britpop universe. Uh, and there are elements of the occult and there are okay. um, kind of pagan dinner ladies in Camden. Sounds bizarre. But uh, I want, if you're interested, I'll send you the script because I want you to play a coked up band manager. <laughs> Good. That sounds like the kind of part I use. That sounds more like the carrying <laughs> parts. He's great fun, <laughs> and he's he's managed the band Stutter, who are all found dead in a circle in a strange ritual. And oh, yeah, so no, I heard, I heard a little bit about this. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, it's sort of into, and it's sort of not so bad. The nineteen nineties being a sort of nostalgia thing. Is did you find did you find it weird that that two thousand and seven is like considered? It feels like well, a slightly nostalgic yeah, look back. That's definitely. slightly terrifying, isn't it? Well, people, because I, I, I get approached a lot by music podcasts that want to talk to me about why I wanted to make a film about 
this era and I didn't you know I wrote a film about a couple of incidents in my life that happened to happen, you know it happened then um but I seem to have become this person that's made the first film from that scene <laughs> which is cool you know but yeah. that wasn't you know the plan but yeah definitely weird when people are like you know it's already become like this Brit pop thing you know but it doesn't seem like that long ago to me but I guess I'm I'm getting older now well, it's go. It starts to go very fast, Doris. I mean, it's, well, it's, uh, it's well, we were terrible... talking about pissing earlier, weren't we? Yeah, about how we much were talking about piss. How much you need to piss tonight? And you already need to piss more in the night than I do, and that's saying something. Um, so, yeah, did you hear uh, me piss earlier when I didn't turn my mic? Didn't off. hear you piss. We this was before was broadcast. That. We had. I advised okay, the I advised the guest to have a wee, and I did. <laughs> I had one too. Um, and uh, but she still, Laura still had her headphones in. So I did. Right. Could, she could hear us, but we could. I tried to piss really quietly. <laughs> it's a bit. It's an important skill for a director. Do you think you're going to be more of a? Are you going to carry on acting, or are you going to move more into the directing role? Do you think now, or is it, or is it, or is it um, hand in hand always? Well, I, I mean, I'm still acting. You know, I still yeah. go to auditions and get parts. When, you know, I, I've got a film that I'm in. Uh, called uh, He Takes the Lead, which is premiering at Manchester Film Festival in March. It's direct. It's actually premiering in Manchester and it's directed by a guy called Thomas Manchester. <laughs> uh, sounds like I'm making it up, but it's true, uh, which is really brilliant. And I'm really proud of that. Uh, and I'm in that acting. Um, right. So I still really love acting. It's just the best, you know, that I've, I fell in love with it, you know, straight away. And it's something I love doing. But uh, no, I like making stuff. I like coming up with stuff and making stuff. And I, I really like love, I love directing. So I'm going to try and do everything as per usual. Yeah. Are you going, are you going to be in stutter? Have you got a part for yourself in stutter? No, I haven't, but right. I think, I think that it would be fun to, I don't know, pop up as like a cab office woman or something or like a, <laughs> a dinner lady or something. I don't know. I might pop myself in there somewhere, but it's very much like I, I've got ideas for pretty much everyone. So I, I, I'm quite looking forward to just being behind camera for that one. I'm really excited yeah. about it. No, it's great. So that's a se- is that a TV series or a sort of... TV series. Yeah. I've already written the whole thing. I'm sure it will get twisted and turned in different ways, but people yeah. seem to be really into it. It's absolutely bananas. <laughs> but there's going to be a great soundtrack. And, you know, it's 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 definitely... I'm hoping it's, it's sort of showing that era and that kind of amazing music and you know in the best light possible and it's going to be really fun but i just wanted to kind of kind of bring in these elements of the occult for some reason yeah well why not i think that sounds good and the, yeah. the, the soundtrack of giddy stratospheres is is you know is one of the the big part things in it as well you must yeah, have spent a lot of time deal. putting that together well actually because because i was in a band during that time i knew most of the band um mm. So I met, similar to sliding into your DMs like a snake, <laughs> I, I slid into uh, lots of band DMs like a snake and said, I want your song. Can I have your song? And they were like, well, yeah. you actually, you kind of have to talk to record, well, record label and stuff like that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, OK. But they, you know, they gave me the blessing. And then I had an uh, awesome guy at Universal Music called Phil Canning, who's become a good mate, who did all the sort of business side of stuff. So I got the kind of OK and then we got them to let us have their songs for way less than, you know, they deserve the massive tunes. But similar to yourself, um, you like the script and like the project. And, yeah. and I'm forever grateful to all of you for coming on board for, for our little budget. With our Do little you make, budget. Can you make a film, a soundtrack album anymore? There's no point, is there, I guess? We were talking about the it, people, yeah. People I think... Said- I'm still talking about it, but it's kind of, I feel like we've kind of missed the boat. I've got, I, in the end, I just thought in my true indie girl fashion, I just made a Spotify playlist and it's yeah. had like, it's had, <laughs> I've made a Giddy Stratospheres film playlist that you can listen to and uh, it's already had fucking loads of listens and I kind of, that's enough for me. I just, I haven't got enough time <laughs> to work out how to release a bloody record. <laughs> If anyone's interested, then get in touch, but yeah. Yes, well, that's definitely true. But I, but I don't, do people... I mean, they do make records now, don't they? But it's, <laughs> it seems to they be do, all, yeah. all music's just there now, isn't it? So It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, all the music I listen to is uh, children's stuff that my kids like. And Katy, I listen to a lot of Katy Perry now. Yeah, so, cool. You know, if, you ever, if you're ever doing a film about Katy Perry, I know a lot about Katy Perry. It's all filth, all of Katy Perry's. I don't really like my six-year-old daughter listening to Katy Perry. Well, it's all her lyrics of, are filth. They're all about spunking, being spunked on. 
Really? Like, yeah. I thought they were all like her roaring and like acting yeah, like a Yeah, they're roaring and they've been, spunk, they've been spunked on. <laughs> roaring and spunking. <laughs> It's not, there, there's know. so many illusions. The fire, the fireworks, all about just show me oh, how your that, colours like, sexy... burst. I don't know. I think ah. it is. I might. I had to listen to it with my in-laws in the back of the car, and I felt very embarrassed. Oh dear! But my six-year-old daughter. She was five then. She was listening to a story about someone's cock being like a firework, making people go oh oh oh, which isn't Pure what a firework jizz. does. Wasn't what a firework does. I think I've done this as material on the podcast before. Oh, anyway, I'll stop now. Uh, jizz, and I listened jizz, jizz. to. I listened to what I've been. I've been listening. We're watching Scooby Doo. You should do a Sco, the Scooby Doo. I was watching Scooby Doo with my son because he he's he bought he had a he had a. <laughs> I'll just talk about myself for a bit, Laura. Go on. Uh, he, he, one of his presents for Christmas was a Scooby Doo haunted mansion. He's never seen Scooby Doo, but he really wanted the Scooby Doo haunted mansion. So I thought you should watch Scooby Doo. But I tried to buy it. I tried to stream it, and it was like forty-two quid a series for Scooby Doo. But I managed, to find, I managed to find a DVD for five quid. But like, I can't. It was like you had to buy every episode. Every episode of Scooby Doo is the same. You're gonna have to pay one pound seventy nine every single episode. Anyway, so we're That's watching. That's a lot Scooby- of money, mate. But we're, yeah. we're watching Scooby Doo today, and my it has blown my son's mind. Yeah. He loves. Yeah. He couldn't he believe it, it when. Couldn't believe it when at the end of the first episode, Scooby was inside the night. It was there. It looked like the ghost had come back, but it was Scooby at the end. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same episode every time. He loved it. He loved it. Oh, so, bless him. Uh, so, yeah, so, but I'm not really, I don't, you know, the, I, I was never massively into music, but certainly the music of the noughties has, has passed me by as a, as a yeah. middle-aged man. So, <laughs> did you, but, did but you but enjoy I, any of the tunes? I, I did enjoy it. I like, you know, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm forced to listen to stuff, I do enjoy it. I don't know why I don't listen to more stuff. But, uh, yeah, so it didn't have a, it didn't resonate with me in the same way a 90s thing would because, mm. um, you know, I, I that was... That we was were, your, I was a radio. Well, I was a radio one DJ in the nineteen nineties. Yeah, of course so, you were. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, know, I know all the music. Yeah, well, you'll you'll love what we've got in store for this. So well, no, yeah. it sounds very, it sounds very, very exciting. Um, uh, and yeah, I don't know who Baby Soul is. Who you've won awards for directing Baby Soul's Miss video. Baby Soul. Yeah, she's yeah. an amazing soul singer. Um, yeah, we we made that. Uh, gosh, it's like this one year just seems like it didn't exist last year at some point. Um, yeah, shot it in a day, and and I yeah won a bunch of awards. I've got one there, so that's cool. Best director, um, for that's that. Pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, right. And uh, another amazing band called Industry Standard. I directed a video recently called Abstract Doom, which is quite Lynchian and weird, but I love doing music videos. It's it's really 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 fun <laughs> for me. <laughs> and so. do you think it's is it still I mean, you know, the, this the art, sort of historically female directors have sort of been overlooked. It's been very difficult for female directors to get work. Is that changing? Is this, is, are you at the sort of vanguard of changing that or is it still uh, difficult for you to? I don't know. I mean, I wonder, I, I have noticed and I, I only noticed this recently that the only artists that have approached me to direct their videos have been women. Right. Um, and I don't want to... I, I don't know. It's quite uncomfortable to think why that might be. Um, maybe I'm scary. I don't know. <laughs> You're scary. Um, You're definitely scary. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like I, I, I haven't. I guess. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of new, aren't I? I don't want to pass yeah. judgment. But I, I do think that we're always struggling a little bit. But I guess we've just got to prove I mean, ourselves. It- but, you know, you're making, you know, it's, it's getting out of there making your own stuff. It feels a little bit to me like within comedy that there's there's been a sea change and like within maybe the comedy shows that are getting on, there's there seem to be more shows mm. that uh, that are fronted by women or that are directed by women, I think. Well, maybe not directed, though, but certainly, you know, the, mm. it, the, there's an effort has been made, whether it's, whether if you evened it all out and looked at it whether it would be anywhere near 50 50 i would doubt but it does seem like a lot of the a lot yeah. of the bigger comedy shows more recently have been i mean fleabag yeah. being the obvious one but but yeah. there's been plenty of other uh sort of female lead led things we were watching um this the T- tina fey produces it it's called girls five ever have you have you seen this i haven't but somebody actually mentioned that to me this morning is it yeah. good I mean, we're enjoying it. Yeah, I think it is good. I thought it was actually a Tina Fey thing that she'd written, but it isn't. She's the executive producer, and she's 
she turns up in it as well. We've only we've only watched about three or four episodes, but it's it, you know it, from a female point of view, a it sort of points out <laughs> how, how sexist all those all the music yeah. of the nineties and the noughties sort of yeah. was in terms of mm. you know being schoolgirls and you know they, it's very funny in terms of the way they they uh, they sort of pastiche the the lyrics of of how women were treated in songs <laughs> yeah yeah it's true uh, but it's it does true. seem good but it, you know it is it is a it's a sitcom revolving around some middle-aged women really, if, if being 40 is middle-aged which i suppose it is so it's you know again it feels like a step in the right direction but it, it feels like america's a bit ahead of us yeah i think with, so with that anyway i mean i do have a lot of mates that are female that are directors and creators so you know i'm i think I think that hopefully we won't be far behind and, and things will even out because there's enough room for everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's just hearing, you know, but it's also the importance of hearing a variety of voices as well. And it, that's, I think that really sort of struck, struck strikes me, you know, for my, I was lucky in that I got, because I'm a, my, a white, a white man that uh, that wasn't such an issue when I was starting out. So, no. I, so, I managed, so I managed to get work, but it was, you know, it was the same voices all the time in films mm. and in t- and in TV. It was this a, a mm. very sort of similar demographic of people talking mm. about very similar things. And so yeah. just to get that variety of, uh, you know, of, of gender and class and yeah. ethnicity and everything, just it... it, it it it's interesting. It's more interesting to watch. Uh, so yeah. I hope I hope that will keep keep on. Well, uh, what, what's really good is that the kind of film festivals. Uh, I'll use uh, BIFA as an example. The British Independent Film Awards. In order to put your film in for an award, you have to tick loads of boxes to include lots of different groups. So you know, I yeah. think it's now you you know I think it can't be ignored now. People that have been left behind. So I think things are changing. Terrific. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. I'll ask you a couple of emergency questions and then we'll uh, we'll let you get on with your day. But uh, do check out Giddy Strats. It's, it's short. That's the wonderful thing as well. As a, as a parent, I have to tell you, when I'm yeah. sitting down to watch a film and it's three hours long, I go, I'm not going to, I'm never going to get through this. But this is what is it? How long is Giddy Strats? An 70? hour and 10 minutes. Yeah, 70 minutes. That's perfect. Yeah. That's what it's everyone so... said. I was worried people would diss us for it, but people are really into the I just think there's no need for most films, don't need yeah. to be more than 90 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and loads of films are just way too long. And yeah. I'm not even going to start to watch the Jane. I'm don't, not inst- very interested in James <laughs> Bond. I was quite interested in this one just because of. It might be a bit different, but I'm not going to watch that. I haven't How got long that is it? It's like three hours long or something. I'm not going to watch oh, that. Jesus. I, can't, I won't be able to stay oh. awake. I won't be able to stay awake. <laughs> right, and let's find out about a bit you from the emergency questions. Have you ever seen a ghost, Laura Jean Marsh? Uh, I tried to convince my mum that I saw a ghost cat once, <laughs> but but I didn't actually see one. <laughs> I just really wanted something interesting to say. So and you've, I remember, pret- you've pretended to see a ghost and it was a I ghost I pretended to see a ghost of a cat in the garden and I remember her saying, you're full of rot. Um, How would you know it was a, ca- a ghost? Was it dressed in old-fashioned <laughs> cat clothes or was it? could you see through it? I mean, I know you couldn't see it. I know you're making I think it up. I came up with this ridiculous this ridiculous story that it like did some weird like backwards dance. <laughs> <laughs> and did like weird stuff and tried to convince my mum that I was more interesting than I was when I was as a five-year-old or six-year-old or something. No. But you know, I haven't. I don't think I've actually seen seen an, a, a ghost except for the ghost cat that didn't exist. Okay. See, I thought you would have. I thought you would have seen a ghost. <laughs> really? Because you know, you you've I'm taken really... you've taken some drugs in your time. I'm, ge- I'm guessing. <laughs> Who? What made you think that? I've just watched your film. Oh right. You were... <laughs> uh, no, I haven't seen a ghost. No. Okay. Uh, um, okay, I don't think I've ever asked anyone this question before. What musical instrument that you don't know how to play do you think you could pick up right now and have a pretty good crack at? See, a musical anyway, you could, probably could. I mm. I, rec- I reckon I could do the trombone. It's one of the hardest brass instruments there is, but it looks easy, doesn't it? What's the one that the, the, uh, did uh, didgeridoo? Didgeridoo. That, yeah, because you could basically just fart into it, couldn't you? <laughs> you could do so. You could make all sorts of noises, and I think it's quite easy. I don't think I've ever had a go on one, but okay. I think I could. I could do that for sure. I think you could. I think you could. I think that should be your next film. 
you saying <laughs> arrogantly saying I reckon I could play a didgeridoo and then failing to do so. Um, who is your favourite Steve? Steve. Probably Coogan, right? Steve Coogan? He's all right. You and... You invented Alan Partridge, my boyfriend. I did invent Alan earlier. Partridge. Thank you for thank you for <laughs> clarifying that. Yeah. Um, he's good. Yeah, he's good. That's a good choice. Okay, I'll yeah. ask you. I'll ask you. Would you rather question? Go on. Um. I'd... Would you rather die on your feet, live on your knees, or slide down a bank of snow on your bottom? Definitely slide down. <laughs> Yeah, it's an obvious one. My... It's, too, it's too easy. Yeah, too easy. definitely. That sounds fun right now. Could All right. Snow. Okay, <laughs> here's a question that I've, again, not asked anyone. Would you rather have Angelina Jolie's lips or Jennifer Aniston's hair? Uh, but the lips would not replace your lips, but be put in the middle of your back. The lips <laughs> would be autonomous and be able to talk and need feeding and would be furious about being transplanted in your back. The hair would be all the hair that has ever grown out of Jennifer Aniston's head and body. <laughs> And you wouldn't be able to trim or shave it off. You'd have a lifetime's worth of admittedly celebrity hair growing on whatever part of the body it initially grew on or nearest equivalent. So what I'm asking is, would you rather have Angelina Jolie's lips on your back, is it? The middle of your back. Yeah, but they're, you need they're alive all the time. And, it, and it's angry about being there. <laughs> or all of Jennifer Aniston's hair that she's ever had in her life. But like, well, what, with, with Aniston's hair, what, what do you mean? With like multiple haircuts on my head? No, just all the hair that's ever grown out of her head just and body where, would be just wherever it was on your head and body. Like cousin it kind of thing? Yeah, well, it would be a lot of hair. You'd be very hairy. Oh, I, don't I think I don't really like the idea of angry lip back. <laughs> no? <laughs> I think angry lip back would be a pain in the ass because you'd just yeah. be... You'd have to get some sort of... You'd have to put things in it, in it to shut it up when you're doing podcast interviews and whatever. It would be I Angelina think... Jolie, though. So, you know, that would be something. You'd have her forever being angry with you. if She's furious with you. I, don't, I think she'd be quite scary if she's angry. I don't, I don't want Angelina... She's in the back, mate. She's going she to do gonna... some lips in your back. I was going to say energy. bum lips. I don't know why. I was going to say <laughs> they're not, Angelina... They're not bum lips. <laughs> I'm gonna say Angelina's. No, I don't want Angelina's lips on my back. Okay. It would be a pain in the bum. I think I'd definitely have Aniston's hair all over my body, and okay. I'd do and I'd kind of my little pony it up and 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 you know plait them and and do all sorts of stuff with them. You have yeah. made your choice. That no yeah. one put that asunder. Um, very good. Look, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can beat that. I don't think I can beat that. So we've got. Giddy Stratospheres, look out for that. The musical videos, Stutter coming up, Venom Falls as well. You haven't mentioned Venom that. Venom Falls, come... you're going to be a fisherman in that. Am I? My goodness. That. Yeah, and definitely. And you're feeding cats. No, feeding um, your fish with ground up cats. I definitely, if I can grind up my own cats to do that, if I can bring in my own <laughs> ground up cats, I would do that. That's for sure. Well, it's lovely that you would want to offer me parts in your uh, projects. Thank you very oh, much for that. You're very, you're a star, wouldn't you? No, oh, thank sure. you. That's very nice. Thank you. Um, and it's lovely to talk to you. And everyone should watch the film, and everyone should go out and make your own films. Yeah, and do it about your own experiences. It. It's absolutely fantastic. Please give a massive round of applause to the amazing Laura Jean Marsh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We'll be back Thank soon you. with some more. Goodbye. Thanks, Laura. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>